Hi everyone, welcome to the first course in NRC 01 PL, Personal Learning, the MOOC offered by the National Research Council in collaboration with the Learning and Performance Support Systems Program. I'm Stephen Downs, I'll be your, your guide, your facilitator, and your sometime presenter through the duration of this course. I want to talk today about something that goes back 15 years in internet time, that's prehistory. And this is learning objects. Because a lot of what we know today about learning objects, about online learning, has to do with learning objects, has to do with some of the core ideas that people came up with back then. There were a lot of assumptions that were being made. Assumptions along the lines of, there are many courses, <clears throat> many institutions, and we can achieve efficiencies by digitizing courses and having common courses taught to many people at once. The premise was that the world does not need a new description of sine wave functions to be created a thousand times a new every September by hand by hundreds, thousands of individual instructors. Would these digital resources be online courses? Well, that wasn't the thinking back then. I know things have changed a bit today where we have nothing but online courses, but back then, the idea was that we would be looking at something smaller and a lot more nimble than an online course. The old way of sharing, we shared parts of courses. We shared textbooks, we shared wall maps, we shared videos, movies, etc. They weren't whole classes. They, they weren't entire resources. And typically sharing the old way involved a fee or a subscription or a cost. But today, a lot of resources are shared the new way. They're shared online. Examples, well, back then included Schoolnet, Merlot, which is a learning object repository that still exists to this day in 2016. Marco Polo used to exist, now it's gone. But these mechanisms of sharing were complicated, they were cumbersome, it's not like today. So what we needed was something better. What we needed back in 2000, 2001, was a system where we had better systems of categorizations, better ways of updating submissions, better ways of tying resources to learning objectives, to outcomes, to competencies, and some way of structuring and defining these resources. It's interesting how all of these old needs are still really prevalent today and still dominate a lot of the discussion of learning resources today. Today, even now, creating an online course is a long, expensive, and difficult project. Tony Bates, back in 2000, 1999, wrote that it took 37 days of subject expert time, $110,000 for 40 students, and included authoring all of course content from scratch. What we wanted to do back then was to change this up to make it a lot cheaper and a lot more efficient. The first principle was rapid application design. The idea here would be that software engineers would reuse program components. These exist today as software libraries or as function libraries or as modules or as plugins. And the idea is that in a rapid design application environment, you can simply drag and drop the subroutine or the function that you need. And the idea was that a course designer could do the same thing. They design a course, they drag in a quiz, they drag in a video, and whatever. Also, what they had in mind back then, which really has kind of gone by the wayside today, is object-oriented design. So you begin with a prototype, and this prototype would inherit the values. So you'd have a basic object was resource, and then you have more precisely defined objects such as book or essay or video. 
They would inherit the properties of a resource, so you can save them, trade them, describe them in the same way, but they would have their own unique properties as well. This led to the creation of something called the OEMS Learning Object Metadata Specification and SCORM, Shareable Courseware Object Reference Model, which later became Shareable Content Object Reference Model. The idea of these approaches, of these specifications, was to define what would be called a learning object, where a learning object would be something that course designers could really, for all practical purposes, just drag and drop into their course. Hasn't really worked out that way, but to a certain degree, we see that kind of approach in the modern learning management system. So for example, questions and tests, you could drag those, drop them into your course, and then customize them. For example, you could create hierarchies of properties of your learning objects so that they would have the same kind of description, they would have the same kind of topic, subject, uh, taxonomy, etc. Course components could be structured the way you would structure a book, the way you would structure a file library. So you'd have a course route, then you'd have the major chapters, etc. It's interesting because as I created this course in edX, this is exactly what the edX, open edX navigation looks like. And that's, this is exactly the way this course is structured. There would be a common language for representing these course components. And that language back in 2000 would be XML. XML is still widely used today as well. We're using a language called JSON. J-S-O-N, JavaScript Object Notation. But the idea is the same, to separate the content of the course from the styling or the presentation of the course. The XML would represent the content, and then you would use CSS or XSLT or some other language to define the style of the course. So here's an example. You would have your book content all described in the XML and the styling of the book, of the chapters, of the verses, etc. would be done by CSS. And doing it this way, you could present the same content in multiple formats and there are companies that did that. So why would we do it this way? Well, consider the advantages. It's structured so it allows us to define courses and course modules and units and even pages as a definition of hierarchies. It's extensible. We could add new tags. We could call something a chapter or a unit or a module or whatever we wanted. But best of all, it was machine readable and machine writable. So you could put this on the internet and you could have computers look them up, organize them, do all kinds of things to them automatically. So Back in 2000, 2001, most documents were authored in HTML, and the idea was that they would all be authored in, well, standard generalized markup language, or ultimately XML, extensible markup language. That really didn't transpire. Today, what we use mostly are what are called WYSIWYG, or what you see is what you get authoring tools that will save the data in some kind of language or another that is machine re readable. The idea of this data though is that it would be portable. We could send it anywhere. We could view it anywhere. We could do whatever we wanted with it. We could also use multimedia. We could put multimedia objects such as video, images, audio recordings, games, animations, whatever we wanted, right into the structure of an XML document. The multimedia would be defined by the type of the object. It would be generated typically by some kind of editor, and the editor would define the content. All learning objects would also be given metadata. Metadata is data about the resource itself. So metadata might, for example, contain a title of the resource, the location of the resource, or a description of the resource. The idea here is that we can create an easy way 
to search for and find resources by using abbreviated descriptions of the resource. This is really useful for doing uh, searches for images or videos, where it's really hard to search for, through the content of the resource, so we search through the metadata. So we'd have simple learning objects, and they would have metadata. The metadata would describe the resource. Then we'd have the data itself, either structured XML text or a non-text object, such as a video or an image, etc. Out of those simple learning objects, we would create complex learning objects, also written in XML, and they would contain and interact with these simple learning objects. So here's a complex learning object. As you can see, it is basically packaged as though it were a com content package. There's metadata for the package itself. There's a table of contents for the package. And then all the individual resources, each of which have content and metadata, just as described before. And we'd take these packages, we would archive them, zip them up, and we could send them through the internet to be ingested and displayed by learning management systems. So we would author a complex learning object within a learning management system. Basically the authoring process would be we take these individual learning objects, drag them and drop them into our course structure, and then save our whole course, voila, complex learning object. We'd select materials for the course, and then these materials would inherit course information, such as the subject, the grade level, the institution, etc. So that when you displayed the learning object, it would display the subject, grade level, etc. from the learning object. So where would we put all of these learning resources? The idea was we would store them in what are called learning object repositories. So again, think about the idea here. We have learning objects, we have simple ones, we have big complex ones, and we're going to store them in a place that contains hundreds, thousands of these learning objects. The reason we do this is so that they're all in one place, that's the idea, and it makes them easy to find and easy to reuse. Because again, the whole concept that we're trying to create here is we create content once, we put it in a learning object repository, and then we use some kind of search system to find these resources, drag them and drop them into our course, and reuse the content. So that was the basis for content syndication as we've come to know it today to some degree. Back then, all of the essential principles were already in operation in other industries. For example, in the news industry, you would have a news agency like Canadian Press or Reuters or Associated Press, and they would have all kinds of news stories in their repository, and individual newspaper editors could just select from those stories produced by these content agencies, drag them and drop them into their own newspaper and create their own newspaper out of syndicated content. And then they would display these learning objects on their own server, on their own website. That was 15 years ago and it's remarkable how little has changed since that time. We still have, to this day, learning management systems. Learning management systems still display courses online where these courses are to a large degree created out of pre-made or prefabricated objects. Now, the structure and the style has changed a little bit since then. They're not nearly as interoperable as they could be. It's, you know, it's, it's fine in theory to move an object from one type of learning management system to another type of learning management system, but nonetheless, it's still possible. And ultimately, this kind of structure is what we have. So the learning object environment that was set up 15 years ago is to a large degree what dominates the learning technology industry today. There have been some changes around the edges, but the core con concept remains the same. One of the reasons that this relates 
especially to personal learning, is that personal learning takes advantage of this core concept, but it uses it in a very different way. But ultimately, what we're working with are the same resources that were being conceived and designed 15 years ago. We're talking about maybe not learning objects properly so-called, but small, mobile, digital resources that are parts of courses that can be stored in repositories and exchanged freely. That's all I want to say for today. I'll be back tomorrow to talk about some of the issues and the objections that this model created as it began to be implemented. Thanks a lot, and I hope you enjoy this first week of personal learning. I'm Stephen Downs.